Well, are you ready to get into y'all's Word today? I am as well. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy chapter 18. We're going to begin with verse 15 in just a moment. And I've entitled this message today, In Defense of Bible Obedience. Now, this is part two. If you were not able to be with us last week, I want to encourage you to watch part one on YouTube or go on the phone app. It'll be there or go on the website, watch part one. But part two will also be able to stand alone by itself. So you'll be able to enjoy the word today, even if you haven't seen part one. So today we're going to be building a case in defense of Bible obedience. So we have a lot of people in modern religion today that says that we're just to have a mental ascension that Jesus is the Christ and that's all that matters. All you have to do is walk an aisle, repeat a prayer, say, I believe, and that's all that matters. There's no other requirement of that person. And I can't find that in the scripture anywhere. It is the most popular doctrine uh, in Christianity today. But I want to take you through the scripture. We'll start in the Torah because the Torah is the foundation for all scripture. You have to have a good foundation in the Torah to be able to interpret the rest of the scripture. Amen. So we'll start in the scripture and then we'll talk about what Yeshua taught. And we'll talk about what Shaul, the apostle Paul, taught. And I'm going to show you in the scripture that we are to have a belief that produces obedience. That is sound. That is solid. That is scriptural, a belief that produces obedience. Because our relationship with the Almighty is within the context of covenant. Covenant is based on promises made and promises kept. The Almighty has made promises. He promises to hear our prayers, to answer our prayers, to fulfill His promises, the promises that we can discover in the Scripture. And our side of the covenant is to have a belief that produces obedience to Him, obedience to His Word. It only makes sense. If we believe and obey, we are within the context of the covenant, and we can expect all of the blessings of the Almighty. Can you say amen? So we're going to start with Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning with verse 15. And this is the second Shema of Torah. All right, so you know about the first Shema of Torah. We quote it every Shabbat when we gather together. And that is the Shema of hearing the words of the Almighty through Moshe. But there's a second Shema. In Torah, and we find it in Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning with verse 15. It says, Yah, your Elohim shall raise up for you, notice it will benefit you, a prophet like me from your midst. So this is Moshe talking. From your brothers, listen to him. So in Hebrew, the word listen is the word Shema. It means to hear with your heart and obey. It's not talking about just hearing with your ears and acknowledging that you've heard something. Many of us can say, yes, I've heard that before. The question is, are you willing to obey it? Because these two concepts of hearing and obeying cannot be separated in Scripture. So we are to shema this prophet like Moshe. Well, we know that Yeshua is the prophet like Moshe. And so we are to hear him with our hearts and obey him. Verse 18 says, I shall raise up for them a prophet like you. This is Yah speaking out of the midst of their brothers, and I shall put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him, and it shall be the man who does not listen to, or shema. That means hear and obey. My words, which he speaks in my name, I require it of him, or I will judge him. So we're supposed to hear and obey the words of Yah, that Yeshua speaks. Can you say good amen? amen? And then Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 22, it's important Shimon Kepha is preaching here, or Simon Peter, and he quotes the same passage of Scripture out of the Torah. For Moshe truly said to the fathers, Yah, your Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Him you shall hear, or him you shall shema, to hear and obey. According to all matters. Now, this is very important, and I want you to get this point because we're going to need this point a little bit later in this message. Notice it says, Him you shall hear according to all matters. In other words, Yeshua is the final word on all matters. So if you happen to be one of those people that say, Well, Yeshua was born under the law, and He taught people under the law, and so we're not under the law, so we don't listen to Yeshua. We listen to Paul. Here we have Simon Peter preaching 
And he says that Yeshua is the end of all matters. His words are the end words of all matters. The final words on everything. Whatever he says to you. Verse 23, and it shall be that every being who does not hear, again, implying Shema, to hear and obey, that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Now, these are, these are harsher terms. And so Simon Peter is saying here that if we're unwilling to hear and obey the words of Yah spoken by Yeshua, we will be utterly destroyed from among the people. All right, so he taught in no uncertain terms that we better hear and obey Yeshua. Now, that's very important. Simon Peter taught that we should hear and obey Yeshua. So get that in your heart, okay? Now let's go to Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 16. And notice what Yeshua taught in the great commandment, or what's called the great commission. Did you know that Yeshua taught obedience when he taught the great commandment? Most people don't realize that. Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 16. And the eleven taught ones went away into Galilee, or to the Galilee, to the mountain which Yeshua had appointed for them. And when they saw him, when they saw Yeshua, they bowed to him, but some doubted. And Yeshua came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore go and make taught ones, or make disciples of all the nations. All right, now this is the great commandment. We're not just supposed to get decisions. We're supposed to go and make disciples. Can you say amen? It's not about a moment of decision. It's not about having a person stand up and walk an aisle and repeat a prayer and they buy a little piece of the rock, a little life insurance policy, and then they can go out and live any way they want to live. That's not what it's about. It's about teaching them to observe all that I have commanded them, Yeshua said. We're supposed to teach them what Yeshua taught. Amen. Notice he didn't say teaching them to observe all that Shaul is going to teach you. Shaul, the Apostle Paul. He does not say that we are to teach them something different that Shaul is going to teach that's different than Yeshua's teachings. Isn't that right? He didn't say that. What did he say? Teaching them, verse 20 to guard or obey all that I have commanded you. So he taught them out of the Tanakh. So there was no New Testament at that time. And so he said, go into all the nations and make disciples and teach them what I've taught you. So he taught them out of the Tanakh. So it's, it makes no sense to say that Everything left of Matthew, that's your right, but it's my left. Everything left of Matthew has been abolished. Because Yeshua said, teach them what I taught you, and Yeshua taught them out of the Tanakh. Now that's not demeaning the apostolic writings. It's also placing value on the Tanakh. Can you say amen? All right teaching them to guard or obey all that I have commanded you, and see I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. So belief and obedience is implied here. Yeshua said that his disciples were to continue teaching what he had taught them. Even after his ascension, they were to continue teaching what he had taught them. All right, so there's, there's no idea here that an apostle is going to come along the Apostle Paul, and teach something different. None whatsoever. And yet that's what religion says. We don't listen to Yeshua anymore because Yeshua was teaching people under the law. We're not under the law. We, we listen now to Paul. Well, we should find out what Paul really taught, and we're going to get there here in just a moment. So go with me over to Matthew chapter 7. We'll pick up with verse 21. What had Yeshua taught? What did he teach his disciples about obedience? It's very important because he, he told them to go and teach others what I taught you. So let's find out what he taught them about obedience. 
Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 21. Yeshua said, Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, shall enter into the reign of the heavens. So it's not what you say you believe that will get you into the kingdom. Now think about that. It's not what you say you believe that will get you into the kingdom. Notice what Yeshua said. Not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, or I believe, or I'm a Christian, or I follow Jesus, shall enter into the reign of the heavens. Notice the next phrase. But he who is doing, everybody say doing. But he who is doing the desire of my Father in the heavens. So doing the will of the Father is prerequisite for entering the kingdom. To get into the kingdom, we must do the will of the Father. Yeshua says nothing about some mental ascension that Jesus is the Christ, granting you access to the kingdom. It's just not there. What he does say is we must do the will of the Father. And how do we discover his his will? By reading his word and being obedient. We must hear with the heart and obey. Amen. Verse 22, many shall say to me in that day, Master, Master, Have we not prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and done many mighty works in your name? This sounds like people that are in ministry, does it not? And they're all doing this ministry in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshua. Verse 23, and then I shall declare to them, I never knew you. In other words, who are you? We've never been intimate. You never bothered to learn my ways. You have not walked in my ways. You're walking in a different way, a foreign way. I never knew you. Depart from me. Why? You who work lawlessness. In other words, you who disobey my word. You who live like there is no law. In other words, because if I had known you and you knew me, you would have kept the commandments. That's a paraphrase of what he he was implying there. If I had known you and you knew me, you would have kept the commandments because that's what Yeshua teaches. But since we were not intimate and you were not truly my disciple, you lived like there was no law of Elohim. I mean, this is what he's implying here. He says, depart from me. You who... Work lawlessness. I didn't know you. You didn't know me. You walked in your own ways. And because we were not intimate and you weren't truly my disciple, then you have lived like there is no law of Elohim. And keep that in mind. Verse 24, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine. Now, Yeshua is going to make it plain. He's going to talk about what Shema really means right here. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. Shema, hearing with your heart and being obedient. Not just recognizing that you've heard something. I've heard people say, oh, he's, is he going to preach that again? I've heard that before. Yeah, but are you doing it? And are you teaching it? Because if you are not doing it and you are not teaching it, you don't know it. All you can do is recognize that you've heard it. Go ahead and say amen. It goes down a little easier when you say amen. (laughs) Amen. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them shall be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain came down and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. It was founded on obedience to the word. Notice that wisdom is associated with hearing and doing the word. If you hear only, you are not wise. If you hear and obey, you are wise. Verse 26, and everyone who hears these words of mine, notice in both cases, they both heard. They both heard both groups of people. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them. It's talking about a mental acknowledgement. Or saying, I believe. It's not a real belief. It's a quasi-belief. It's a pretend belief. Because that kind of belief, if they don't obey, produces lawlessness. Amen. 
And you know people that have this kind of belief. They're quasi-believers. They're, they're make-believe believers. Amen. They say, I believe, but they don't obey. It's what you do that verifies what you believe. I'm not really interested in what you say you believe. I'll take a look at your life and tell you what you believe. Amen. You let your light so shine that men and women would see your good works. That's obedience to the scripture. And have a desire to glorify your father who's in the heavenlies. Amen. It's by what I see. That's how I tell you the difference. You shall know them by their fruit. Not what they say, but what they do. Can you say amen? And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them shall be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came down and the floods came and the winds blew and they beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall. So Yeshua is talking about destruction coming to those who hear but do not obey. He calls them foolish people. So I wonder how many people are stuck in religion today who go and hear, but they don't obey. Or they make excuses for their disobedience. Or they say, this part of the scripture doesn't apply to me. They're hearing, but they're not obeying. And Yeshua says, that's foolish. It's foolish to hear and not obey. You're inviting destruction when you hear and you do not obey. So let's move along here. The scripture says obedience to the commandments brings light to the world. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 23 says, For the command is a lamp and the Torah is light. Yeshua said in Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 13, You, implying my obedient ones, are the salt of the earth. But if the salt becomes tasteless, if you stop being obedient and setting the example of righteousness... How shall it be seasoned? For it is no longer of any use but to be thrown out and to be trodden down by men. See, the disobedient are useless for the kingdom. They're like salt that's lost its savor. Those who say they believe but don't obey are tasteless salt, ready to be thrown out and trodden down by men. Look at verse 14. You, implying my obedient ones, are the light of the world. It is impossible for a city to be hidden on a mountain. In other words, obedience cannot go unnoticed. If you obey, you will be noticed. Obedience sets you apart. To obey the word sets you apart from the rest of the world. Can you say amen? Verse 15, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it shines to all those in the house. Let your light or your obedience to the scriptures so shine before men so that they see your good works. Stop talking about what you believe and just live it out. Obey the scripture and you'll become a lamp. A torch, a light to the dark world. Let your light so shine, not just shine, before men so that they see your good works and praise your Father who is in the heavens. So your way of life, your obedience to the Scripture is a light to the dark world. So what Scriptures was Yeshua referring to in this teaching? That's an interesting thought. He was talking about the Tanakh. The Torah. And we know that because of the following verse. Look at verse 17. Do not think I came to destroy or abolish the Torah of the prophets. I did not come to destroy but to complete. Don't even let the thought cross your mind that it was the mission of Yeshua to come to abolish the Torah. Now why does he say that? Because he probably knew that religion would take it there. And that there would be millions of people who actually entertained that thought that Yeshua came to abolish the Torah. And yet he starts out in this verse saying, don't even think it. 
Do not think I came to destroy or abolish the Torah of the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete, to fill it up, to fill it to its highest spiritual application. For truly, I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away. Well, why does he say the heaven and the earth? Because in the Torah, the Almighty calls the heaven and the earth to be a witness for the Torah. And as long as the witnesses still stand, so does the Torah. Can you say amen? amen? For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one yod, that's the smallest of the Hebrew letters, or one tittle, that's the little decorations on the Hebrew letters, shall by no means, everybody say no means, pass from the Torah till all be done, or till all is accomplished, till everything written has come to pass. And there's still a lot in the Torah and the prophets that have not yet come to pass. Verse 19, whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands or is disobedient to one of the least of Elohim's commands and teaches men so, teaches men to disobey or teaches lawlessness, that there is no law of Elohim, shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them these commandments but whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. In other words, if you're obedient to the commandments and you teach others to be obedient to the commandments, you'll be great. Now, I'm not doing what I'm doing just because I want to be great, but I'm glad to be in that group. I'm glad I'm not up here today like there, there will be so many tomorrow teaching people that all they need to do is mentally ascend that Jesus is the Christ. Say you believe, and that's all there is to it. And they teach that the Torah has been abolished, and everything left of Matthew doesn't apply to us. You know what I mean by left? Left of Matthew. In other words, the largest portion of the set-apart written scriptures is abolished. And no man has the right to abolish the scriptures. Yeshua said, all authority has been given to me. He could have, but didn't. Shaul had no authority to abolish scripture. Amen. Religion tries to abolish the scripture. And in the minds of many people, they've been successful through deception. But in the days that we're living in, the Almighty is shining the light again. And calling us out of that deception. Hallelujah. Verse 20, for I say to you that unless your righteousness or your obedience to the scriptures, and he's speaking of the Torah and the prophets here, the original Hebrew scriptures, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. So what was the sin of the scribes and the Pharisees? The sin of hypocrisy. And Yeshua said, they say, but do not do. So if you want to fall in the category of the sin of the scribes and the Pharisees, then say, but don't do. Say you believe, but don't obey. Say you love Yah, but love your traditions more than the set-apart written Scripture. Then you find yourself squarely in the midst of the scribes and the Pharisees, the ones who are Hypocrites, because they said and did not do. Matthew chapter 23 and verse 1. Then Yeshua spoke to the crowds and to his taught ones, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moshe. There's a seat in the synagogue called the seat of Moshe. That's where they sit to teach the words of Moshe, Moses. Therefore, whatever they say to you, guard or obey. In other words, when they teach Moshe, guard and do. Do what Moshe said to do, but do not do according to their works. Why, Yeshua? For they say and do not do. Don't be one who says but does not do. All right. Now, I can hear, I can hear them crying, the ones who say and do not do. I can hear them crying now. It's not about rules. It's about relationship. Have you heard that? 
It's not about rules, it's about relationship. Have you heard that? That's their way of saying, I can disobey because it's not about rules, it's about relationship. You hear it all the time if you're listening. But here's the point. You want to have a relationship with the Almighty? Who gets to set the context for that? Do you get to set the context for that relationship? You are the one who wants to have a relationship with Him. But He sets the context for the relationship in the Scripture. Now let's take a moment and read some of these verses. Exodus chapter 20, beginning with verse 6. So this passage is within the context of the command not to have any other mighty ones before Yah, not to have any graven images and not to bow down before those graven images because he's a jealous L. He's jealous over the ones he's in a relationship with. All right? So what does it say? But showing loving commitment or a loving relationship to thousands... Now, don't stop right there. After the comment says, to those who love me and guard or obey my commands. Yah says he wants to have a relationship with thousands, but it's based upon their love for him, and their love for him is demonstrated in that they obey his commands. So if you want to know what spells love to the Almighty, it's simply obedience to his commands. If you obey his commands, you are loving him. If you disobey His commands, it doesn't matter how many times you say, Oh, I love Yah. If you're disobedient, you're not showing love to the Master. Can you say amen? It doesn't matter how great the context of your church service might be and how wonderful the praise and worship music is that day or how spiritual it all feels or looks. If disobedience is being taught then what's being taught is rebellion against the Almighty. There's no love in that. He does not see love in that. Can you say amen? Now look at John chapter 14 and verse 15. Notice what Yeshua said. If you love me, you shall guard my commands. Now what's he doing? He's simply quoting what his father said in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 6. These are not some different commands. They are the same commands the Father was speaking of. Yeshua was the perfect representation of the Father on the earth. All He did was say the same thing that His Father said. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 6, He says, If you love Me, you shall guard or obey My commands. And then John chapter 14, verse 21, Yeshua said, He who possesses my commands and guards them or obeys them, it is he who loves me. All right, who loves him? The one possessing and obeying. Not enough just to know the commands. Now, many people in religion, I, I say that, you know, sincere Christians live by a good solid nine commandments. Come on, say amen. It goes down easier when you say amen. That's the sincere ones. It's not enough just to possess the commands. You must obey them. He who possesses my commands and guards them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me by obeying my commands shall be loved by my Father because I'm representing him on the earth. And I shall love him and manifest myself to him. What is this? Another direct reference to Exodus chapter 20 verse 6. Yeshua is speaking on behalf of His Father. Again, these aren't different commands. They're the same commands that His Father gave. And then John chapter 14, beginning with verse 23, Yeshua answered him, If anyone loves me, in other words, if anyone wants a relationship with me, he shall guard or obey my word. And my Father shall love him, and we shall come to him and make our stay with him. Now, that's relationship, is it not? And that relationship hinges upon obedience to the Word. Notice he doesn't say anything about, just tell me what you believe. Just say what you believe. Say, Master, Master. Make a case that 
you're prophesying in my name, or you're casting out demons in my name, or you're doing miracles in my name. We already covered that verse. If you say and you do not do, you're a hypocrite. And you're not showing love for the Father. So if you want a relationship, that relationship hinges upon obedience to the Word. Nothing else is mentioned in all these verses, only obedience. All right, go with me over to Luke chapter 18, and we'll pick up with verse 18. Now, it's interesting that David said earlier that if you run across something you haven't heard before, instead of just completely rejecting it, really study it out. Go deeper with it. You may have been taught something that's not correct. You may have an impression that's erroneous. Amen. And so I'm going to talk about this passage in Luke pertaining to what's called the rich young ruler. And I'm going to glean from this passage. Now, I'm going to say up front what I'm going to tell you in this passage. Yeshua taught that we must keep the commandments and follow him to receive eternal life. Now, I know for a lot of religious people, boy, they're, they're choking over that right there. But I'm going to show you what the scripture says. Luke chapter 18, verse 18. And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit everlasting life? What is this young ruler wanting to inherit? Everlasting life. Do you think Yeshua was confused about the question? Or do you think he's going to answer the question the way it was asked? So this rich young ruler is asking about inheriting everlasting life. So Yeshua said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except one, Elohim. All right, he's talking about his father who is good. Verse 20, you know the commands. Now, isn't it interesting that when this young man asked about everlasting life, Yeshua took him directly to the commands? Why not bypass the commands? Be more in line with modern religion if we just bypass the commands, right? Let's just talk about what you say you believe versus what you do. But that's not where Yeshua took him. And didn't we already establish that the final word on every matter is Yeshua's? So we better start paying attention to Yeshua again. And if we have Shaul or the Apostle Paul saying something different or in disagreement with Yeshua, then it's not Shaul, but it's our interpretation of Shaul. That's the problem. Can you say amen? All right, look at verse 20. You know the commands. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Respect your father and your mother. And he's quoting... The love people commands of the Ten Commandments, of the Ten Words. That's Exodus chapter 20, verses 12 through 16, and Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 16 through 20. So he's talking about the love people commands. And he said, all these I have watched over from my youth. So he says, I've, I've been obedient to the love people commands. He doesn't say it that way, but that's the fact. He says, I've watched over these. And hearing this, Yeshua said to him, yet one you lack. And what is the one that he lacks? He lacks the love Elohim commands. There are four love Elohim commands in the ten words. And he lacks that component of the commandments, the love Elohim. You say, why do you say that? Because he loved his money more than he loved Elohim. In other words, he'd made an idol out of his money. So what did Yeshua do? He went directly after the idol. He said, get rid of your idol. Start loving Yah the way he wants to be loved. And follow me. All right. And hearing this, Yeshua said to him, yet one you lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. Get rid of your idol and you shall have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Come follow me. Do what I do. Learn from me. Love what I love. Hate what I hate. Be like me. Because if you're like me, you're like my father. 
If you follow me, you will be in obedience. Amen? Yeshua taught obedience to the commands of Elohim and following Him. That's a strong point, and I hope it doesn't go in one ear and out the other. What did Yeshua teach here? He taught obedience to the commandments of Elohim and following Him. Verse 23, but when he heard this, when the ruler heard this, he became intensely sad, for he was extremely rich. He couldn't give up his idol. He couldn't give up his money. Yeshua taught obedience to the commandments and belief in Him. All right? Now, I can bear that out in the apostolic writings. Go with me over to Revelation chapter 12. We're going to look at verse 17. True believers are those keeping the commandments of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yeshua. And we see it right here in the book of Revelation more than once. Now, the book of Revelation is in complete agreement with the teachings of Yeshua. It says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to fight with the remnant of her seed, talking about the end time believers, those guarding or obeying the commands of Elohim, the Torah commandments, and possessing the witness of Yeshua Messiah. Is that what it says? Is that what Yeshua taught? What does it say? Those guarding or obeying the commands of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yeshua Messiah. Not one or the other, but both. Now, do we have a second witness? Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here is the endurance of the set-apart ones, the set-apart disciples of Yeshua. Here are those guarding or obeying the commands of Elohim and the belief of Yeshua. Isn't that what Yeshua taught? Now some would say, well, that's just talking about the two commandments to love Elohim and love people. This is talking about the commands of Elohim, not some general Boiling down of all the commandments where Yeshua said, the greatest commandment is you shall love Yah, your Elohim, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and there's one like it, love your neighbor as yourself. He goes on to say, upon these two, all of the others hinge. That doesn't do away with all the others. It just simply says that those two are general categories for every other command. Love Yah and love people. All right? Now, people that don't want to discover what the Ten Commandments actually say, or they don't want to go any further and discover what the Torah actually says, they fall into the error of thinking that they can define what it means to love Yah, and they can define what it means to love people. You don't get to do that. Elohim makes it very clear what he means by His love Yah commandments and His love people commandments. We have to bother to find out by reading His Word. Can you say amen? So we see right here in the book of Revelation that it says that end time believers are going to obey the commandments of Elohim and possess the witness of Yeshua. All right. Let's quickly go over a few verses that reveal to us what Yeshua taught is the standard for judgment. How many of you want to know how Yeshua is going to judge us? Do you want to know what the standard for judgment is? I mean, I wouldn't want to enter into judgment unless I understood how I was going to be judged, what I was going to be judged upon. Can you say amen? All right, we're talking about Yeshua and what he taught. Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, Yeshua said, For the son of Adam is going to come in the esteem of his father with his messengers or his angels, and then he shall, notice, reward each according to his works. What he did, not what he says he believes. Yeshua said he's going to judge everyone according to his works. Let's make it plain. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. 
Yeshua said, and see, I am coming speedily, and my reward is with me, notice, to give to each one according to his work. What he does, not what he says he believes. Because you can say you believe one thing, but your work proves another. You shall know them by their fruit, what they do, not what they say. John chapter 5, verse 28. Again, Yeshua said, Do not marvel at this, because the hour is coming, in which all those in the tomb shall hear His voice, and shall come forth those who have what? Done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have practiced evil matters to a resurrection of judgment. This is staying consistent with everything else that Yeshua has taught about the judgment. Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 41. Yeshua said, The son of Adam shall send out his messengers, or his angels, and they shall gather out of his reign all the stumbling blocks, those who cause sin and offense. That's what that's talking about. And those doing lawlessness or practicing disobedience. So those practicing disobedience will be removed. And shall throw them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous, who are the righteous? Those obeying the scriptures. Shall shine forth as the sun. He's quoting Daniel chapter 12 and verse 3. In the reign of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And I would have to say that the religious world today is very hard of hearing. And I can imagine that I'll be criticized when I put this message out. But you know I've never been afraid of criticism. Revelation chapter 22, picking up with verse 13. Yeshua said, I am the Aleph and the Tall." The beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those, what? Doing His commands. So you're blessed if you're doing His commands. And by the way, when this was written, there was no, quote, New Testament compiled. So that the authority or the right shall be theirs unto the tree of life. Or to eat of the tree of life. So how are you going to have the right to eat of the tree of life? Do His commands. And to enter through the gates into the city, the new Jerusalem. But outside are the dogs and those who enchant with drugs and those who whore and the murderers and the idolaters and all who love and what? Do falsehood. So there are commands against all those things. So what is this telling us? The ones outside are the ones who are disobedient. Now I mentioned this earlier. Some will say, well, Yeshua was under the law and taught people under the law, but we're not under the law, so we don't follow Yeshua's teachings. We follow Paul. Have you heard that? Let's take a moment and just look at what Paul actually taught about Yeshua's teachings. We have to start with 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. Now, please get this in your spirit. I have taught this several times, but you have to see this as a rule of thumb when you're trying to interpret Paul's writings. Shaul writes, If anyone teaches differently and does not agree to the sound words, those of our Master Yeshua Messiah... All right, so right here in the very first verse that we're reading, Shaul is saying that all sound doctrine comes from Yeshua's words. So if you're going to walk in sound doctrine, who do you need to listen to? If you're going to walk in sound doctrine. Now, when you stand before the Almighty in judgment, if he asks you, who did you listen to? Are you going to feel comfortable pointing at Paul? Well, I'm going to show you here in a moment that Shaul followed Yeshua. But a lot of people say, we follow Shaul, and Shaul taught differently than Yeshua. That's an erroneous statement. 
Shaul never taught differently than Yeshua. And this is a proof text. If anyone teaches differently, anything different, and does not agree, if what they teach does not agree to the sound words, those of our Master Yeshua Messiah, and to the teaching which is according to reverence, this person who teaches differently and in disagreement is puffed up. He's proud. Understanding none at all. He doesn't understand anything. But is sick about questionings and verbal battles, from which come envy, strife, slander, and wicked suspicions. Worthless disputes of men of corrupt minds and deprived of the truth. If anybody is teaching something different than what Yeshua taught, they have a corrupt mind and they're deprived of the truth. Now, who said that? Shaul or Paul, who think that reverence is a means of gain. Notice what he says, withdraw from such. That's the standard that Paul places upon every other teacher. So he must also play by the same standard. If Shaul ever taught anything differently or if he ever taught anything that disagreed with Yeshua's teachings, then according to Paul's own words, we have to withdraw from Paul. So what does that tell us? Paul never, ever taught anything different or in disagreement with Yeshua's doctrines. If you think that, that Shaul or Paul is teaching something different, it's not what he wrote. It's your interpretation of what he wrote. Maybe you need to back up, get the Hebraic context and reinterpret and get it right. All right. Well, here's another witness to that. Romans chapter 16, beginning with verse 25. And to him and to Elohim who is able to establish you according to my good news. This is Shaul writing. Notice, and the preaching of Yeshua Messiah. Now, who said that? Shaul. And what did Shaul say? What did Paul say? Paul said, Elohim is able to establish you according to what? The preaching of Yeshua Messiah. Now, if Shaul was thinking that there was something that Yeshua taught that wouldn't apply to us, do you think he would say that? Would he say that Elohim is able to establish you according to the preaching of Yeshua Messiah? And not say, oh yeah, but there are some passages that won't be applying to you. He says nothing like that. He says, you will be established according to the preaching of Yeshua Messiah. Hallelujah. Doesn't that make it easier for us? Who to follow? Who to follow? Do we follow Yeshua? Do we follow Shaul? Who are we to follow? It's not that complicated. Religion makes it complicated. We are to follow Yeshua. Why don't we pay attention to what he said? He said, follow me. He never said follow Shaul. He never said follow religion. He never said follow a denomination. Amen. He never said follow traditions of men. He said follow me. Why do you do what you do and teach what you teach? Because I'm doing what Yeshua did. And I'm teaching what Yeshua taught. The good news is Shaul lines up. If you interpret him correctly. Amen. All right. So you know that in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 1. Shaul writes, become imitators of me as I also am of Messiah. So what does Paul teach about the necessity of obedience? Let's touch on this briefly. Titus chapter 2, verse 14. It says, who gave himself for us, speaking of Yeshua, to redeem us from all lawlessness. This is Shaul speaking. Yeshua gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness. Or from all disobedience. And to cleanse for himself a people. His own possession. Ardent for what? Good works. Or obedience to the scripture. So Yeshua has redeemed us from disobedience. And cleansed for himself a people. His own possession. Ardent for obedience. And then Romans 2, beginning with verse 12, For as many as sinned or transgressed the Torah without 
Torah, speaking of the Gentiles, they were without Torah, shall also perish without Torah. And as many as sinned or transgressed the Torah in the Torah, speaking of the Jews, shall be judged by the Torah. For not the hearers of the Torah are righteous in the sight of Elohim, but the doers of the Torah shall be declared right. Now who wrote that? Shaul wrote that. Now for us to be able to obey the Torah in a manner that pleases the Almighty, we must believe in Yeshua. And we must receive the promise that Yah made to Avraham and his capital S seed, the Messiah. And that is the promise of the indwelling set-apart spirit. And if we believe and receive the promise of the indwelling set-apart spirit, the spirit then gives us the what? The want to obey and the power to obey. We've talked about that many times. Matter of fact, if you go back and watch part one, you'll see we taught that. All right. So quickly, Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 28. This is Shaul writing. For we reckon that a man is declared right, or you could say forgiven of past sins, by belief in Messiah without, you know, if you look into the language here, you'll find out that a better translation of this, that word that's been translated without, is apart from. Apart from. For we reckon that a man is declared right by belief in Messiah without or apart from works of Torah. In other words, you cannot be justified by any degree of obedience to the Torah if you do not believe in Yeshua Messiah. Let's make that clear. Because that'll be the first thing that they want to criticize. That we're teaching a works-based salvation. (laughs) That's not what we're teaching at all. Verse 29, or is he the Elohim of the Yehudim only, the Jews who had the Torah, and not also of the nations? Yes, of the nations also, since it is one Elohim who shall declare right, bring us to a place of forgiveness, justification, the circumcised, or the Jews, by belief, and the uncircumcised, the Gentiles, through belief. Look at verse 31. Now that we've established that fact that we all must believe, the question is, what then shall we do with the Torah? If we are justified by belief in Yeshua Messiah, what then shall we do with the Torah? Should we discard it? Yeshua said he didn't come to abolish it. What are we to do with it? Look at verse 31. Do we then nullify or abolish the Torah Through the belief, or does our belief in Yeshua abolish the Torah? What's the next four words? Let it not be. On the contrary, which means the direct opposite is true, we, or our belief in Yeshua, establish or uphold the Torah. So our belief in Yeshua does not tear down, it does not abolish, it does not demean or demolish the Torah. It upholds the Torah. Can you say amen? Which upholds what we're talking about. It's a belief unto obedience. Not a quasi-belief or a make-believe belief unto lawlessness. Can you say amen? All right. Now, I'm going to close with this passage out of James. And I want to set this up by saying so many people pit Paul against James. And James against Paul. Or Shaul against Yaakov. Yaakov against Shaul. And they say they don't agree. And if they say they don't agree, then we're left to decide on our own who's telling the truth and who we're going to follow. Now, I just explained to you that Shaul did not say that our belief in Yeshua abolishes the Torah. And I showed you several passages of Scripture where Shaul says that it's by what we do. It's our obedience that's important. So we know that. What Shaul was saying is simply this. Torah obedience without belief in Yeshua is dead. I want to make it really plain for everybody. This is what he's saying. Torah obedience apart from or without belief in Yeshua is dead. 
See, if you need to repent of dead works, dead works is thinking that you're going to be justified by Torah obedience without believing in Yeshua. Because Torah obedience without belief in Yeshua is dead. As a matter of fact, you're not even obeying the Torah if you don't believe in Yeshua. We started with that verse, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. The Torah commands the people to Shema, the prophet like Moshe, who is Yeshua, to hear with the heart and obey. All right, so what does James teach? James teaches that belief in Yeshua without Torah obedience or without obedience is dead. Let me say it again. Belief in Yeshua without obedience Without Torah, obedience is dead. So we have one, Shaul, saying Torah obedience without belief in Yeshua is dead. And we have the other, James, saying that belief in Yeshua without Torah obedience is dead. Now, they're saying the same thing from two different perspectives. What are they saying? You have to have them both. You must have them both. Belief that leads to obedience. That's our side of the covenant. Quickly, James chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. My brothers, what use is it for anyone to say he has belief but does not have works or does not have obedience? What use is it that people say, I believe, but they don't obey? Now look at the next sentence. This belief, this quasi-belief, this make-believe belief is unable to save him. Saying you believe but you don't obey cannot save you. That's what that says. And if a brother or sister is naked and in need of daily food, but one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, but you do not give them of the bodily needs, what use is it? Now, this is a little deeper than what it seems at the surface because the Torah commands that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. We would never do that to ourselves. When you're hungry, you don't stand in the kitchen and say, be warmed and filled. What do you do? You go to the refrigerator. Okay, so th this is simply saying that when you say you believe, but you disobey the Torah, you're not loving your neighbor as yourself. That's a make-believe belief. Can you say amen? Verse 17. So also belief, if it does not have works or obedience is in itself dead. But someone might say, you have belief and I have works or obedience. Show me your belief without your works or your obedience, and I shall show you my belief by my works or by my obedience. There it is. That's what I've been preaching this whole time. I don't care what you say. I love you, but I don't really care what you say. What I care about is what you do. The light that you put forth from your life. Preach a sermon and use words if you have to. Amen? Verse 19, you believe that Elohim is one. That's Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. You do well. The demons also believe and shudder. And you've heard me say, you have to have more than demon belief. Demons believe, but they don't obey. You have to have more than what they have. Amen. But do you wish to know, O oh foolish man, that the belief without the works or without obedience is dead? Can we get that in our spirits today? Saying you believe, but you are not obedient, that is a dead belief. A dead belief cannot save you. Now, I know I'm just wreaking havoc on much of the most popular Christian doctrine that exists today. But we speak the truth in love. All right, quickly, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father declared right by works or by obedience when he offered Isaac his son, on the slaughter place? Do you see that the belief was working with his works or his obedience? And by the works or by the obedience, the belief was perfected. Again, you prove what you believe by what you do. And the scripture was filled, which says, 
Abraham believed Elohim, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. That's Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he called him he who loves Elohim. Now, did, didn't we already make that point clear today? How do you love Elohim? By being obedient, by obeying his commands. And so Abraham loved Elohim by obeying his commands. You see then that a man is declared right by works or by obedience and not by belief alone. You got to have them both. The right and the left hand. You got to have them both. They work together. In the same way was not Rahab the whore also declared right by works when she received the messengers or the spies and sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead. You ever seen a dead body? As a minister, I've seen a lot of dead bodies over 30 years. You see a body, you know that there's no life in it. The body without the spirit is dead. So also the belief, or what you say you believe, is dead if you do not obey. What you say you believe is dead without the works. Amen? All right, I rest my case today. Hallelujah.